Hey, everybody. Hopefully, all of you had a nice fall break. Did you miss us? I think you guys did miss us because we've been off the air for a while. Caring about connection things, and that's my YouTube literally in the background. That's how many tabs I have open because we have a lot to get uh, to in regards to reviewing content today. So, my name is Thomas Sheedy, president of Atheist for Liberty. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Um, we have a lot to talk about. The culture wars rage on, discussions about religion rage on, and given the events that have happened with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the conflict against Hamas, religion's been in the limelight. Atheists for Liberty's had to cover that for quite a bit. More and more woke incidents keep occurring in relation especially to religion, so we've been having to cover that as well, and some disappointing news that we really have to get into today, but also a lot of great things too. And uh, of course, this series continues to bring on new and amazing guests, but we also I like to bring on recurring guests that add great value, and we have an amazing guest on uh, for all of you to witness again tonight. I want to get into a few things, though, first before we proceed here. Um, so our member of the week is Gene Wynn. Be like Gene, guys, and become a member today at Atheists for Liberty at atheistsforliberty.org. We are a 501c3 educational nonprofit organization. We're doing a lot of amazing things to fight for free speech, free thinking, and freedom for all. We're providing educational tools, more and more of these for you online, but we're now starting to meet in person more and more and more because there is that demand for us to normalize atheism, preserve free thinking, safeguard secularism, and advance individual liberty. So I keep getting my DM spammed. I keep getting um, new topic ideas, and this is a topic I almost don't even want to discuss too much today. Uh, but I think it is it is a necessity. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring in our guest today. So Atheist for Liberty advisor um, and former executive director of the Center for Inquiry, Ron Lindsay. Ron, good to have you on. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for having me back again. Uh, glad to have great you. Talking to you. I, I, last time I remember having you, you were you were literally our, our fourth guest um, nearly a, uh, two years ago at this point. Uh, but that's how much you've been a long supporter, a longstanding supporter of our organization. I, I read, you know, your long bio back in the day, but now I talk to you so casually and we communicate so much about the same things. We vent about the same problems that. Um, and we'll have a lot of that tonight, I think. Yeah, I think we're I think we're going to do a lot of that tonight. And um you know, I just want to say to the audience here, you know, I, I call you quite a bit sometimes to talk about new ideas of what we are doing at AFL, some of the problems that we have, some of the culture war issues that we see. And I, I view you as an advisor, you know, to rightly go to because you and I are seeing a lot of the same consequences of people not taking the issues of theocracy seriously, wokeism seriously. You really believe so heavily in, in the mission of atheist liberty. So I want to say thank you for that. But, but you almost strike me as a, as a very different kind of advisor in that regard. You know, there's some advisors that we talk to more than others, and you're one of them. Um, and I think for a, good a very good reason, and I think we're going to get into a lot of those reasons why um, in the show tonight. So I want to say, uh, you know, just before we, we get into it, thank you so much for all of that. No, it's always a pleasure to work with you, and I enjoy talking with you. And again, it's great bouncing ideas off of you, and uh, always come away from our conversations uh, enriched, really, intellectually. I appreciate that the back and forth we have on, on many issues. Yes. I remember when we I had you on nearly two years ago, I talked about how um, the Center for Inquiry Student uh, Activism Conference, all those years ago was the first atheist event I went to in person. And one of the reasons I think you and I were able to connect so much as well was because we have a longstanding commitment to wanting to spread reason and rationality to as many people as humanly possible. So when the news of Ayan Hirsi Ali, a well-known human rights activist around the world, one of the most famous intellectuals in all the 21st century, came out as a Christian, it stunned not only you, um, but, but myself as well. Um, I want to yes. make a bit of a disclaimer before we move forward in this discussion, everybody. Um, I'm a founding member, as well as Ayan Hirsi Ali is a founding member, of an organization called the Clarity Coalition. Um, it's an organization that is trying to stop the spread of Islamism throughout the Western world, so mostly Western Europe and North America. I have a great deal of respect for Ion Hirsi Ali. Um, and not only that, when a lot of Atheists for Liberty's critics have said, well, you guys are anti-woke and yet you're atheists and you're fighting for civilization and secularism, who are some of these big thought leaders that you look up to that sh you know share your so-called values? In many of my PowerPoint presentations, Ayan Hirsi Ali was one of them. 
which is all the more reason why I am more disappointed that a few days ago she released an article called, and I'll try to share my screen here. Um, share my screen here at this moment. Um, why I am now a Christian. And Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, goes into this saying in the subtitle, atheism cannot equip us for civilizational war. Um, I read this article. Um, Ron, I know you read this article um, as well. But I'm thinking I'd love to go over this line by line or paragraph by paragraph. It's not that long for the audience to see how with deep respect to Ayan Hirsi Ali as an individual, she's wrong about a, a lot of what she says here. Um, and, yes. and it's sad. It's actually, a, in many respects, just a total distortion of the history of Christianity. Shows also a misunderstanding of what atheism stands for, uh, especially when she talks about you know, the meaning of life, etc. It's just, as you pointed out, disappointing on so many different levels and actually very sad. Um, yeah. And in, in some respects, kind of annoying, too, because, again, because of her, the way she misreads history and attributes to Christianity things which simply Christianity was not responsible. You know, when she talks about freedom of speech and freedom of conscience as being the gifts of Christianity, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many counterexamples to that. We could go on, you know, for hours about that, but I'll let you go ahead. Sorry. No, for I, 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 I really appreciate that. Um, and, and if I feel like if anybody else wrote an article like this, I, I, I thought we'd have somebody like Ayan Hirsi Ali literally in a stream with us to, to, you know, I, I could easily do an episode with Ayan Hirsi Ali as well, debunking this stuff, but it's just sad that it has to be her. Um, so she begins this article by saying, in 2002, I discovered a 1927 lecture by Bertrand Russell entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. It did not cross my mind as I read it that one day, nearly a century after he delivered it to the South London branch of the National Secular Society, I would be compelled to write an essay with precisely the opposite title. Me too. Stunned. Um, she follows by saying, the year before, I had publicly condemned the terrorist attacks of the 19 men who had hijacked passenger jets and crashed them into the Twin Towers in New York. They had done it in the name of my religion, Islam. I was a Muslim then, although not a practicing one. If I truly condemned their actions, then where did that leave me? The underlying principle that justified the attacks was religious after all. The idea of jihad or holy war against the infidels. Was it possible for me, um, as for many members of the Muslim community, simply to distance myself from the action uh, and its horrific results? Um, for her, it didn't distance her. It made her want to speak out um, you know, more against it. Um, she says uh, as well, at the time, there were many eminent leaders in the West politicians, scholars, journalists, and other experts who insisted that the terrorists were motivated by reasons other than the ones they had, and their leader, Osama bin Laden, had articulated so clearly. So Islam had an alibi. Um, now, this is around the time, everybody, where, where people were really waking up to the reality of radical Islamic terror in the Western world. Um, new atheism was born out of these attacks. So Ayan Hirsi Ali in many cases, was seen as a unofficial horseman uh, alongside uh, Richard Dawkins, the late Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and Sam Harris. Um, I'm assuming, Ron, you've probably done what you could when you were um, executive director at CFI to platform and to showcase a lot of Ion's works, too. Sure, and of course. Yes. Was the boom of skepticism in the West when it came to faith. Uh, so she, she was one of our, the, key, the key persons that we would highlight in plenty of our organizations and think tanks. Um, and she's right that, you know, uh, many people try to pap paper over or excuse the, the actions of, you know, the 9-11 terrorists and say, well, it, radical Islam isn't you know, responsible for this. Uh, and she was quite right to point out that this, you know, fundamentalist Islam interpreted the way these guys interpret it, obviously it had some responsibility for it. So yeah. she was quite right at that time in, in pointing out how we need to look at the, the causes of actions like this. Uh, so again, she was very perceptive uh, in her conclusions at that time. And uh, unfortunately that has not continued to the present no. day, so. No, unfortunately not. Um, she continues to say, this excuse making was not only condescending towards Muslims, 
It also gave many Westerners a chance to retreat into denial. Blaming the errors of U.S. foreign policy was easier than contemplating the possibility that we were confronted with a religious war. We have seen a similar tendency in the past five weeks as millions of people sympathetic to the plight of Gazans seek to rationalize the October 7th terrorist attacks as a justified response to the policies of the Israeli government. She's right about that. Right. She's right about that. Um, uh, she, she, in a way, I, I think I, I mentioned this to you when we were backstage. You know, we're going a little ahead, I guess, in the article, but with her becoming a Christian, she ends up saying, stating, and I'll, I'll read the actual words, everybody, about how, you know, she still doesn't believe in God. She's still technically an atheist, but she calls herself a Christian. I, I tell people that stuff like that is actually disrespectful towards Christians. Um, we, we, we have supporters, people who have actually paid the membership in AFL, a minority of our members who are actually not atheists, but like the content that we do. And these people are actual Christians who believe that God actually exists and a Jesus actually exists, that there is a Holy Trinity. It's, it's not respectful towards those people. It's condescending towards yeah. those Christians to claim to believe in something in this kind of milquetoast, intellectual, dark webby kind of way where you don't actually believe the tenets of the faith. Yeah, this is what's very, one of the remarkable aspects of her, her statement. Uh, obviously, you know, we respect everyone's right to freedom of, of belief and religion. And if someone on an intellectual level is convinced of the truth of Christianity, I mean, they're mistaken, but that's fine. You know, we, that's the conclusion they've come to. Mm -hmm. But it's clear from her statement that that's not her case. Rather, she is making this conversion. And I use that term loosely here because it's so different what she's doing, that she thinks just for political reasons, for what she calls reasons of you know saving our civilization kind of a, a pragmatic uh conversion if you will to christianity so it's not really a conversion at the intellectual level uh, that she's you know now has a faith in christianity per se as a religion it's that she sees it as a tool to you know to combat uh things that we obviously we think we should combat too obviously we're against the excesses of of uh, leftism of wokeism uh, we're against the militant Islam. We're against authoritarian regimes. All these dogmas. <laughs> right, right. That's, yeah. But where we differ is we see liberal democracy as the bulwark against these tendencies and yes. as something that's worth fighting for. Uh, and instead to say, oh, we have to retreat into Christianity. I mean, at, at the end, if you're trading one dogma for another, it's just, right. yeah, that's not the way it, to go. In a way, I just it makes you then have sympathy for woke people then, because um, the reason why I'm against wokeism is because I see wokeism as religion. So why are like that? That's that's why I became such an ardent anti woke activist as well. Um, and so if we're just going back into the same dogma that we started to fight 20 years ago, then what's the point of even getting involved in any of these fights? Exactly. Right. Um, speaking of purpose and meaning. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, I guess I'll continue here. Um, when I read Russell's lecture, I found my cognitive dissidence easy. It was a relief to adopt an attitude of skept skepticism. Is, is that the British spelling of it? Uh, towards religious doctrine, discard my faith in God and declare that no such entity existed. Best of all, I could reject the existence of hell and the danger of everlasting punishment. Um, I guess for a selfish reason you could, but also there's no evidence that, that a hell exists as well. Yeah, um, so it's not just some comfort that you might not burn in some everlasting hellfire. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, granted, I, I have big problems with religion, but the main reason I'm an atheist is because I just don't see any evidence that a God exists. You know, right. I would love to see, I would love to see my family members, my, my dead family members when I die. I would love um, to to have my consciousness continue after death. I would love all these things. You know, if any Christians try to put me on the spot and say that, I'd actually admit it. I think it would be cool. I don't want to just die and and cease to exist. But just because I want something that way, it doesn't mean that I'm going to get that. Um, you know, like Richard Dawkins has talked about, the truth also still matters. Um, so she continues by saying that Russell's... Uh, um, Russell's assertion that religion is based primarily on fear resonated with me. I had lived for too long in terror of all the gruesome punishments that awaited me. While I had abandoned all the rational reasons for believing in God, 
that a rational fear of hellfire still lingered. Russell's conclusion thus came as something of a relief. When I die, I shall rot. It's almost poetic. Um, uh, she, she continues to say, to understand why I became an atheist 20 years ago, you first need to understand the kind of Muslim I had been. I was a teenager when the Muslim brother, Brotherhood penetrated my community in Nairobi, Kenya in 1985. I don't think I'd even understood religious practice before the coming of the Brotherhood. I'd endured the rituals and abol um, ablutions, um, prayers and fasting as tedious and pointless. Um, and, and to be fair, everybody, if you read Ion's books, she goes into her upbringing, um, the horror, uh, the abuse, the militancy of it all. Um, it, is, uh, it is absolutely horrific. Um, and she has uh, uh, spoken plenty of times, and you can watch on YouTube a lot of the lectures that she's given about, about her upbringing as well. Um, the preachers of the Muslim Brotherhood changed this. They articulated a direction, the straight path, a purpose to work towards admission into Allah's paradise after death, a method, the prophet's instruction manual of do's and don'ts, the halal and the haram. is a detailed supplement to the Quran the Hadith spelled out how to put into practice the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, God and the devil. The Brotherhood preachers left nothing to the imagination. They gave us a choice. Strive to live by the prophet's manual and reap the glorious rewards in the hereafter. On this earth, meanwhile, the greatest achievement possible was to die as a martyr, as a martyr for the sake of Allah. The alternative, indulging in the pleasure of the world, was to earn Allah's wrath and be condemned to an eternal life in hellfire. Some of the worldly pleasures they were decrying included reading novels, listening to music, dancing, and going to the cinema, all of which I was ashamed to admit that I adored. The most striking quality of the Muslim Brotherhood was their ability to transform me and my fellow teenagers from passive believers into activists almost overnight. We didn't just say things or pray for things, we did things. As girls, we donned the burqa and swore off Western fashion and makeup. The boys cultivated their facial hair to the greatest extent possible. They wore the white dress like Tab worn in Arab countries or had their trousers shortened above their ankle bones. We operated in groups and volunteered our services and charity to the poor, the old, the disabled, and the weak. We urged fellow Muslims to pray and demanded that non-Muslims convert to Islam. Now, I could be wrong about... Um, what she's trying to do here, but it's almost like she is, in a sense, romanticizing some of the good parts of some of the good parts that she saw of Islam. This this idea that she had a sense of purpose, um, that despite all the negative things she said about her Islamic upbringing, um, that at least it gave her an a, a sense of being an activist in the world. Right. Um, exactly. That's a kind of connotation I'm kind of getting from her here. I think you're drawing the right conclusion. That's the right, right inference. Uh, but to me, that points out one of the things that I dislike, and I think many atheists dislike about religion. I mean, some people apparently want or need or feel they need explicit directions on how to live, that they can't decide for themselves, you know, what is best for them or what's right or wrong. They need a, a Bible, a, a mullah, a priest, a rabbi to direct them. Uh, to some extent, that's, that's that's somewhat sad. I mean, it takes away the autonomy that people should have as individuals to give direction to their own lives. Mm -hmm. But it is it is for some people one of the attractions of religion, and I think she yeah. suggests that here correctly. If for her, that may be how she found purpose, and may explain also why now she feels she has to go back to religion to find purpose, which yeah. I think is a mistake. Certainly, I don't think again. Uh, one reason I'm an atheist, first of all, I'm an atheist because on an intellectual level, I can't accept, you know, religious doctrines. I just find them right. incredible. But I also find atheism liberating in the sense that there is no omnipotent being and certainly no one who says they're a prophet for an omnipotent being that I have to listen to and obey and, you know, slavishly follow what that they command. Exactly. Uh, you, you have uh, your cognitive liberty to right. act in any way you please as an individual in the greatest time humanity's ever lived. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and for a while, I thought she was perpetuating the same exact thing here. So 
she, I promise everybody, we're going, we're going to get through more of these paragraphs. But I, I just find it to be very important that we go over the details here. She says during Islamic study sessions, we shared with the um, the preacher in charge of the session our worries. For instance, um, what should we do about the friends we loved and felt loyal to, but who refused to accept our dawah? Um, in response. We were reminded repeatedly about the clarity of the prophet's instructions. We were told in no uncertain terms that we could not be loyal to Allah and Muhammad, um, while also maintaining friendships and loyalty towards the unbelievers. If they explicitly rejected our summons to Islam, we were to hate and curse them. Here, a special hatred was reserved for one subset of believer, unbeliever, the Jew. We cursed the Jews multiple times a day and expressed horror, disgust, and anger at the litany of offenses he had allegedly committed. The Jew had betrayed our prophet. Uh, he had occupied the holy mosque in Jerusalem. He continued to spread corruption of the heart, mind, and soul. You can see why, to someone who had been through such a religious schooling, atheism seemed so appealing. Bertrand Russell offered a simple zero-cost escape from an unbearable life of self-denial and harassment of other people. For him, there was no credible case for the existence of God. Religion, Russell argued, was rooted in fear. Fear is the basis of the whole thing. Fear of the mysterious, fear of defeat, fear of death. Um, she then proceeds to say, and this is now where we get into the, the meat of this. As an atheist, I thought I would lose that fear. I also found an entirely new circle of friends. It's different from the preachers of the Muslim Brotherhood, as one could imagine. The more I spent with them, people such as Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, the more confident I felt that I had made the right choice. For the atheists were clever, there was also a great deal of fun. Oh, that is true. <laughs> yes. So here we go. So what changed? Why do I call myself a Christian now? Part of the answer is global. Western civilization is under threat from three different but related forces. The resurgence of great power authoritarianism and expansionism in the forms of the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir Putin's Russia. The rise of global Islamism, which threatens to mobilize a vast population against the West. And the viral spread of woke ideology, which is eating into the moral fiber of the next generation. Let me just stop saying. Yes. He's right. I mean, she's right about all three of those threats. The they are. What she sees as the remedy for that. It's, it's a bad remedy. And... Yeah. Some of the, these very problems, let's talk about Vladimir Putin's Russia, for example. Vladimir Putin's Russia is an Orthodox Christian Russia. Right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there was state atheism that existed during Stalin's reign of terror and I guess Lenin's reign too for a brief moment. Khrushchev lightened it up a little bit when he was, um, when he was uh, premier. Um, but then, uh, you know, during, I think, future administrations, there was still kind of a cracking down on religion. So for a while, there was kind of a state atheism that existed in the Soviet Union. But once the Russian Federation became a thing in 1991, Orthodox Christianity poured into that country, poured into that country. And it's why 10 years ago, for anybody who was paying attention to politics then, there was a big debate over gay rights in Russia. There was a big debate over freedom of speech in Russia because Vladimir Putin's dictatorship, obviously you believed in the big leader, Putin, the president of Russia, but you also believed in his power um, made possible by God and by the church. Sure. Um, the Chinese Communist Party, I say this to everybody when they talk about like Stalin and Mao being atheists, um, these were almost religious states where Stalin, Mao, Kim Il-sung, they were seen as their own gods. Um, you know, you might not have the traditional monotheistic religions that, that, you know, that we understand of today, but it was basically the same way. It's why the late Christopher Hitchens called um, the idea of heaven an eternal North Korea. So they're very much religious. Sure. Well, the key thing is that they're all based on dogma. You know, you yeah. have... The, this is a different set of beliefs, but the idea is there's one set of truths, right? You have to, if you're in Stalin's Russia, you have to believe in, you know, he is essentially the prophet or God or whatever you want to. And, you know, Marxism is, is the revelation that's given to us that we have to accept. Uh, so again, it's essentially a, if you want to call it a secular religion, but the, the yeah. key point is that it's a set of dogmas that you have to accept or, you're condemned essentially, just like you mm -hmm. know, fundamentalist Islam or in 
Christianity prior to the uh, 1800s, if you're a heretic, you're ostracized or worse, right? Maybe killed. Yep. That, that's how it was. And, um, and then all these other groups are, are, you know, not so, not so much better. So like looking at, for example, at, you know, global Islamism. Well, why did Osama bin Laden attack the USS Cole in 1998? Why did Osama bin Laden, um, you know, have his people crash two planes into the World Trade Center, another plane into the Pentagon? And, and um, you know, you had the other crash in Pennsylvania, total of over 3,000 Americans um, being killed. Um, oh, bin Laden saw the West as evil and secular and degenerate and all these things. And he used his faith, his own dogma to justify these attacks to bring 3,000 Americans closer to his God for judgment. Right. Exactly. Um, so this is why I, I'm, I'm, I'm very annoyed with this article existing because in a way this also concedes to the Islamists. This concedes, in my opinion, towards all these very people that we all came together in the name of reason to, to fight against. Um, and then woke ideology is another great example too. People say, oh, well, wokeism is, is entirely atheistic. Um, I understand how some people, like you mentioned, how some people say it's kind of like a secular religion, but also I try to tell people too, um, there are woke churches out there. So in the name of intersectionality, in the name of wokeism, you'll find this a lot in Black Lives Matter, for instance. Um, they'll A lot of them will say, well, God supports me doing these things in the streets. God supports me, um, you know, spreading uh, the the woke awareness of people waking up to the 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 systemic racism and hatred that is the United States. A lot of these people say that God supports what they're saying. I, I highly doubt that if you go to a modern day woke BLM rally, the vast majority of them are going to be atheists. In fact, it's oh. likely demographically going to be quite the opposite. Um, so that's, what, look, that's how God has been used you know, throughout history. Yeah. God's, God is very malleable. Turns out God always supports what you believe, right? So if you want to- post, Whatever I want. Yeah. Whatever you want. Yeah, if you have a certain interpretation of how things should go, oh, wow, God supports me. It turns out that's a revelation that God exactly supports Black, Black Lives Matter or God supports you know, suppression of women in, in Afghanistan or God supports this or that. It's Like my God is pro-choice. Well, yeah, no, right. my God is pro-life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it can be God and religion because- these stories are made up and we have no evidence that these things actually exist. They are yeah. able to be easily used to justify any policy position that one has. Um, right. And that's what makes religion so dangerous. That's what right. makes it, as Hitchens says, poison everything. Um, so, oh, okay, there we go. My computer did not freeze. She proceeds to say, we endeavor to fend off these threats with modern secular tools military, economic, diplomatic, and technological efforts to defeat, bribe, persuade, appease, or surveil. And yet with every round of conflict, we find ourselves losing ground. We are either running out of money with our national debt in tens of trillions of dollars, or we're losing our, our lead in the technical, technological race with China. I'll to quickly talk about that as well. Okay, so she uses a few examples. National debt, that's purely a fiscal issue. We've been debating the national debt for decades, even before new atheism became popular and way, way more people were religious. That's a purely fiscal problem right there that has nothing yeah, to do with it. Yeah, I'm not sure it cuts any way with respect to religion, Christianity, yeah. or anything else. It's just it's an observation, and obviously people have different opinions about how we should reduce the debt. But Exactly. Yeah. And the technological race with China, uh, I think that's valid, but I don't think that's due to us lacking religion. I actually, and maybe this is where my very conservative colleagues will agree with me, um, I, I, I don't call myself a nationalist per se, but I understand the need of wanting to be proud of one's country. And I guess one benefit of the Cold War was the United States and the Soviet Union both had populations that were super nationalistic and proud of their, their flag and their country, that it caused them to want to beat the other in terms of every, every category, space yeah. race, uh, the arms race, everything like that. So I think that's a whole separate geopolitical problem. That's not that's not an issue of religion either, because you have certain nations that are more homogenous um, in terms of their population and also that are very they're very nationalistic and patriotic. Like like look at half of these European countries. They don't have Christianity still, but a lot of them are still very proud um, in being Swedish and French and British and German. Um, so so that's I, I don't believe in that that being a good argument either. No. Um some of them are valid problems, but they're but 
religion, um, people losing faith in the Western world uh, is not is not a reason for those problems. Um, she says, but we can't fight off these formidable forces unless we answer the question, what is it that unites us? The response that God is dead seems insufficient. So too does the attempt to find solace in the rules-based liberal international order. The only credible answer, I believe, lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Okay, I, I got to stop there. Because Please. This, this is one of the I got some to say, but I bet you got some to say. This, this is one of the things that really annoyed me. First of all, the rules-based you know, liberal international order is exactly what we should be defending. And yeah. if, if you look at you know, the last couple of centuries, I mean, the growth of freedom that has come about, and it's not due to Christianity, not due to religion at all, is due to enlightenment values. Yes. Beginning with the idea that with respect to religion, people should have the freedom to decide for themselves what to believe. You know, separation of church and state. Then, you know, we had the idea that government should come from the consent of the government, that people should be free to, to vote and decide on who should govern them. Obviously, it didn't apply to everyone at first, but again, over time, we began to recognize that all people, whatever their race, should be treated equally. So, you know, slavery came to an end. Mm -hmm. It wasn't religion that ended slavery. It was no, if anything, it was religion that promoted it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, again, it was one of the things that was justified. If you, if you look at the Confederacy, and they were very religious in the Confederacy, what they argued for was that, well, the Bible, in the Bible, there was slavery. No one in the Bible condemned slavery. Moses actually endorsed it. So this idea that somehow, you know, religion was responsible for ending slavery is just absurd. And again, you know, through the march of, you know, the, the 1800s into the 20th century, we have a growth of freedom. Uh, you know, the idea that people should be able to direct their own lives. You know, we used to have laws that prohibited divorce, for example. Uh, we had laws up until the 1950s and 1960s that prohibited contraception, of all things. Yeah. Uh, and even today, we've had in the last few, few decades uh, a recognition of personal autonomy that's important, you know, recognition of same-sex ma sex, sex marriage. Right. All these things, we've had an enlargement of personal freedom and autonomy, and that is something worth fighting for. That is what we it should is. fight for. We shouldn't retreat into dogma and think, oh, we have to somehow become Christian. And another thing that bothers me, the whole Judeo-Christian tradition, this is an invention of the 20th century, because, you know, for most of Christianity's history, the way Christians treated Jews, there was no joint Judeo-Christian. Exactly. Tradition. Very separate. Very, very separate. Uh, okay. So, again, this is like a, a rewrite of history. It, it is. And the thing that here's one thing I'll concede to to our opposition in the grand scale of human history. Democracy, the idea of having this concept of freedom, living in a constitutional republic, it is very new. We really have only had this for the last near near um, 250 years. Yeah. You know, that, that I'll agree. Throughout most of human civilization, we have lived in monarchy. We have lived based on religion. We have grown most of, of human, um, human settlements, you know, based on the sword, not the book, not based on reason. And, you know, it, it is very true that there is more of a record of humanity still living under those dictatorships than under free states. That doesn't mean, though, that the Enlightenment is a lost cause. That doesn't mean that, oh, well, the United States one day is going to end. It's going to suffer the same fate as the Roman Roman Empire did or the Roman Republic or, you know, Britain's day came and then the U.S. popped up. And now the U.S. is going to fall. That it doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that the ideals that we have are not worth fighting for. Maybe it is possible that our enemies could defeat us. It's very possible that we could lose some wars in the future. But that's the point of living. Life sure. is a risk. Yeah, and I'd no rather lose fighting for ideals that make all of our lives better in the one experiment that could die and maybe never rise again than live through constant suffering and a constant form of slavery, having to obey some eternal leader just because, oh, well, it, it worked so well for the last few thousand years. Right. And it, the reality is it didn't work that well. No. Right. Yeah. There's a reason why so many people from all these dictatorships and monarchies in 2023 are still flooding to the West, flooding to the United States. 
Um, some are coming here to try to turn our civilization into more of what we're seeing in the Islamic world. But I would argue the majority of people are coming here because they want to have a better life, because they like our freedom, because our values are better. They're better. Right. Um, they're not better because, oh, we believe in some holy book. They're better because we allowed anybody to believe in whatever holy book they want or no holy book at all. It right. wasn't part of our litmus test to becoming a Westerner. That pisses me off. Yeah. And then also the, the her saying the only credible answer, I believe, lies in her desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Let's look at statistics. Um, I'll actually, let me see, do I do I have this? Here, I, here, I, I shared a tweet um, recently, um, now an X post. Uh, this is a, a, a guy named Ryan, um, Ryan Burge. He comes up with a lot of data when it comes to religious affiliation in the United States. Uh, views about God among boomers and Generation X are almost exactly the same. 60% say they believe in God without a doubt. For millennials, they started at 55%, but have now declined to 42%. For Gen Z, they started at 45% and have declined to 35%. Um, I, I saw uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, who is basically a Catholic nationalist. Um, I think that's even too generous to how his views are now. He even came up with an article on his Gab account or a snippet of data on his Gab account talking about how Gen Z is just going way, 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 way down when it comes to religious affiliation. And Gen Z are about to become the new adults that in 10, 15 years are the people in power in their prime. Gen Z and late millennials, and then eventually Gen Alpha. Um, we're becoming a more secular society. So um, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate. Let's pretend Ayan Hirsi Ali, with, with respect to her, of course, let's pretend that she's right with this claim. Let's pretend that she says that the only answer to safeguard secular civilization is to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. You're going to lose. You're going to lose because you're going to have countless populations in the Western world not believe in any of it. Right. This is why I try to tell people, and some people just don't like the fact that the math exists, but it does. Too bad. So we. Need, this is why I tell people when marketing atheists for liberty, everybody... We believe that in order to save Western civilization and defend enlightenment values and religious freedom for all, we need to find secular solutions to these problems. Secular solutions to these problems. I don't care how weird I look in saying it. I don't care if some people in the conservative movement don't like it when I say it or the liberty movement or whatever niche or content creator we try to hang out with um, next to you when, I, when we say these things. It's still the truth. And with respect to Ion Hersi Ali, that's that's another thing that that she just has not taken into account, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, she then says that legacy consists of an elaborate set of ideas and institutions designed to safeguard human life, freedom and dignity from the nation state and the rule of law to the institutions of science, health and learning. As Tom Holland has shown in his marvelous book, Dominion, all sorts of apparently secular freedoms of the market of conscience and of the press find their roots in Christianity. That's just false. I, mean, I, that's, I, that's I, I think false. it's totally false. Yeah. I think they find their roots, I'll, I'll, I'll concede, yeah. they find their roots in nations with majority Christian populations, but it's not because of Christianity. It's no. because those Western populations, despite them being Christian, use reason in order to, to understand right. that freedom is a good concept. Right. Again, I think it's the inheritance of the Enlightenment. That's when we first yes. began to understand, you know, the idea of human rights, you know, instead of, you know, tribal values or values based on, you know, your particular religion or, or whatever, it's really an invention of the 1700s. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. just making, I mean, a lot of historians agree that there's a, there's a marvelous book, uh, which I would recommend. I think I recommend the, uh, can, can remember the author's name, Lynn Hunt. Hmm. Uh, called Inventing Human Rights. And I think it won a Pulitzer Prize or some kind of prize that came out, of, I don't know, a dozen years ago. But she goes through the whole history of how we came about this idea of human rights. And before hmm. the 1700s, uh, except for, you know, the occasional philosophers or whatever, there was no concept of global human rights. You know, there are rights for people of your particular faith or what have you, or, hmm. or maybe of your tribe or nation. But the idea of human rights in general is a fairly recent invention, and it owes nothing to Christianity or to yeah. Islam or, or any other religion. And and 
I know we have a very mixed audience politically at AFL. We have some that are that very much like the idea that we're in a global economy who are, who are maybe more liberal or libertarian. And then we have some conservatives and even borderline populists on the matter. You can even argue, guys, from a, from a nationalistic populist standpoint, you believe that America is a great country, right? A country of greatness, a country with amazing values and freedoms worth protecting. Um, that that other nations, other, maybe other nations that you don't want America to help or whatever, don't have. Well, why then is America so great, right? Our greatness. They're great because of the ideas that we have. It's America is great because we ended up succeeding in creating the first superpower that cares about the conscience and freedom of the person rather than the goals of the king, mandated by God to serve everybody. We said no to that. Uh, yeah. So... Um, and I, I actually, I'll skip a few paragraphs here, but I'll go through this one on the top. She says, I have come to realize that Russell and my atheist friends failed to see the wood for the trees. The wood is the civilization built on the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is the story of the West, warts and all. Russell's critique of those contradictions in Christian doctrine is serious, but also too narrow in scope. I, I don't think too it's too narrow at all. I think he, he yeah. nails it. In fact, I think he nailed it at an earlier time when a lot of his fellow Westerners didn't see it. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, uh, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna skip this. Um, so guys, if you wanna read the full article, type in why I am now a Christian, Ion Hersiali on Google or whatever browser you're on. Um, uh, so uh, we'll, just, we'll just go um, into this one last argument that she has here. Um, I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace of Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I have also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Okay. Yeah, this, this is, yeah. This um, shows her, you know, I, I, obviously she was an atheist for a while. I mean, she still calls herself just a lapsed atheist. And again, I don't know mm -hmm. if she's really intellectually converted to religion or not, or sees it as uh, politically practical. But this shows a misunderstanding of what atheism is supposed to, you know, deliver or whatever. Atheism, and this is what I find actually so liberating about not having a religion, where mm -hmm. a religion says this is what, your life's meaning is, you know, essentially, yes. basically, you serve as a cog in some cosmic machine. I'm not sure why that gives life's meaning. Atheism liberates you to find significance for yourself, yes. right? To make your own choices in life, to use your autonomy to shape and give significance and direction to your life. That is liberating. So and, this and, idea, yeah, go ahead. And even though atheism, atheism is still a negation, it is not a positive statement, technically. No. This idea as well that once you become an atheist, there is no purpose in life. There's nothing. It's not like, I don't know, we've had plenty of thinkers throughout the past several decades and even centuries showing that you can have purpose and meaning in life through other philosophies and ways of thinking. Um, you know, uh, another advisor of ours, um, Michael Shermer, he's written so many books throughout the last several decades about how you can. Steven Pinker as well. Um, uh, we have a, a whole wide array of atheist thinkers who have who have tried to show that I, I was just on the phone with a great friend of mine, Craig Biddle. He's the head of the Objective Standard Institute, I, Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. Um, so I can understand people saying, oh, well, you atheists then should have some examples of, of positives, net positive viewpoints and philosophies. Sure. And there are plenty of them. There are, there plenty, are of them. plenty of them. It's not like we're just going to live in this materialistic, automatronic, uh, you know, existence where we're just a group of cells waiting till death. Not at all. I, I I actually understand in a way where Jordan Peterson is coming from. I think it is important for humans to have purpose and meaning. But this idea that we need this this ancient kind of spirituality to give it to us, right. I'm telling you guys, again, right. the data's not supporting that. Right. It's and not. We don't, we don't need some self-declared prophet to tell us what we should have as our meaning or significance. Again, it's something that we on our own discover. Obviously, you know, people have different ideas, whatever, but I certainly have find significance in, in being in my life. And this idea that somehow, and this is the argument you get, well, you know, death closes all, right? When you're dead, you're dead. Well, fine. I mean, I don't think this, you know, your work or your life loses significance just because it right. doesn't last forever. 
In fact, quite to the contrary. In fact, I find this whole idea of eternity, which when you think about it, either means an everlasting existence, mm-hmm. which frankly would be after a while you go crazy. I mean, you really think about the implications of what eternity yeah. would be. I mean, it'd be maddening. Or, you know, you get some of those people mean, oh, well, it's no passage of time at all. It just, you know, you're misinterpreting it. Well, if you're, it's no passage of time at all, how's that different from just being dead? I don't, you know, I don't yeah. understand. So, and, and even religious people can, most religious people in the West can understand that too. Like, um, I have a lot of uh, bonfires in my yard with, with my friends, plenty of them who are very apolitical. They don't really talk about these issues with me, and they're fairly religious people. And um, one day I was having a conversation with them over a bunch of beers and I told them, you know, one cool superpower that I'd love to have in, in a hypothetical game of questions that we were playing is, is um, having immortality or being able to live uh, way longer than the average human lifespan. And even these religious friends of mine, a lot of them ended up saying to me, well, Thomas, wouldn't life get bleak then? Wouldn't you want to then die? These are religious people telling me this. Right. And I said, you know, yeah, you know what? If I if I had the if I had the ability to have like an off switch in this magical scenario, I definitely would. So it's not like this is the thing that's annoying me so much. Ayan is an atheist, and she's saying things that even plenty of our religious friends know is kind of kind of silly of an example. Right. Yeah. Um and, and and by the way, again, everybody, for those who are just tuning in now. Um, again, much respect for Ion her CLE. I am still a founding member of the Clarity Coalition. Um, she has been a champion of human rights around the world. I don't think that is going to change, but I'm also not going to hide um, uh, you know, my disappointment here, nor are any of our other advisors hiding their disappointment. Um, because essentially for me, as president of Atheist Liberty, by the way, everybody, this article is basically, if you could rename the article, it's basically why Atheists for Liberty shouldn't exist. That's another thing, too. For all of you that are supporting AFL, we are we have we we create we were created out of the ashes of the new atheist movement because wokeism destroyed it. But to show people that you don't have to be religious to oppose wokeism as well, you don't have to be religious to oppose authoritarianism. We continued a lot of the great messages that the new atheists were having in the old school style way of thinking um, that the majority of atheists, I would argue, still support. So it's it's kind of annoying to me because. Here I am, and here's plenty of our amazing volunteers and staff fighting up a hill to try to get us normalized more and more in these movements and communities, and we're succeeding. And then here comes, bang, an article like this that can easily be used by theocrats or or even woke people against us or whatever. Well, one of your big allies, Ion Hirsi Ali, she's our Christian. You guys got to really go back to Christianity. Look how famous Ion Hirsi Ali is for, for writing this. There's got to be a problem with atheism now. Um, it's, it's, it's annoying. It's really annoying. So it's, yeah. um, it's, it's why I, I, I thought it was very necessary for us to, for, to talk sure. about this as well, um, sure. because we, we're still existing and we're still existing for a good reason. We get more members every day, get more supporters every day, more viewers every day for a reason, because there is so much demand, because we're moving into more of a secular world. And we have to use secular tools for these for these issues. Yeah, um, it, it, but, you know, the article is, in a sense, uh, a reminder of an unfortunate, I don't know, the tendency might be too strong a, a term, but certainly there are some people who think that to fight leftist ideology, leftist, you know, ideology of group identity, the politics of identity that I talk about in my book, yes. somehow we need to turn to religion. Uh, and no, it is true. I think one thing that motivates, for example, the, the extreme right is this sense that, well, we're being, co- you know, confronted with this whole idea of, you know, uh, everything is blamed on white supremacy. And we have to have mm-hmm. this drive for equity, which means equal outcomes for everyone. So they think, well, how do we fight this? We have to go back to this, this you know, old style, you know, really, Christian nationalism. Right. Well, that's wrong. I mean, it, but unfortunately, some Absolutely. people have that point of view. And I think this is kind of an example of that. And this is one reason it's so disappointing. And at the same time, something we, we need to be alert to is a, a temptation that some people have and we shouldn't give into. Because there, there are ways to combat this push for, you know, basing everything on group identity just by arguing against it, which is what I do in my book, right? Absolutely. And, and we're going to get to talking about your book in a bit. Um, and, and I love that you brought up that point just now, too. Um, I pay attention to, to kind of 
the history of the culture wars quite a bit. And I, I talk about this literally in every streaming episode we do here about how I think a lot, there were atheists. There have been atheists that, that went into like conservatism, for instance, after new atheism kind of collapsed uh, as a movement and, um, and other communities, they, they got a new kind of high and purpose in fighting against wokeism. And so because they wanted to almost stay relevant with an increasing religious audience that they've been getting because they got exposure to, to people in the conservative movement and, and the grassroots populations within it, they stopped talking about atheism or some of them got very soft in their approach to religion for political reasons, not because all of a sudden God popped up and, and started to exist or they became really convinced that there is a God or that religion's great, but some of them did it literally for political reasons. And, and this is another reason why uh, myself and a few others created Atheists for Liberty to show that we can go into conservatism and libertarianism and the classical liberal spaces mm -hmm. and not agree with every single thing these people are saying. What happened to, oh, agree to disagree, we're all in favor of free speech here. That, that was a lot of the talking, those were a lot of the talking points that were in the intellectual dark web. Oh, we're all, we're all cool here despite our differences. We can be adults. Well, we, we agreed to disagree, I would argue as atheists, but plenty of the Christians that we tried to, you know, shake hands with to fight wokeism, some of them actually were polite to us and said, you know what, let's not have the religion debate. But plenty of them still attacked atheism. Plenty of them still attacked yeah. us yeah. and bashed us. But we wanted to be seen in the room with the cool kids. So we stopped talking about atheism. Um, I tweeted this out uh, a few days ago. Um, I tried to warn people that non-woke atheists being soft on Christianity is a bad idea. Some thought I was exaggerating. Atheist IDWs, non-woke atheists, some of them famous people, were told a few years ago that if we put our atheism aside for a bit, we can defeat wokeism. That bit has passed. Now we know that was a lie. So there were some atheists who just wanted to look cool and go on podcasts and go on shows and sell whatever. I'm not calling out any particular individuals. Some of them also, um, even though some of them have gotten softer, um, have had legit claim to have legitimate reasons for doing it, even if I disagree with them. Um, but I, I've seen it and it's it's really annoying and it's really disgusting because we and I would argue we at Atheist Liberty are we're, su we're becoming increasingly successful at what we're doing. But we're trying to build a good brand here and we need all of you to help us with that. Right, and right. how do you guys feel when you see one of your heroes promoting reason, promoting enlightenment values, promoting rationality, saying, oh, all of that. Everything that I said and all the conferences that I've been at, all the programs that I put out to get you involved in politics, you involved in atheism. Yeah, that was a waste. See ya. Jesus is real or God's real or I'm a Christian now. Yeah, right. yeah. It's, it's sad. And it's, it's wrong both as a matter of principle and wrong as a matter of tactics, really. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to stop reading the, the rest of the article here, but you guys can, again, research this. Um, why I am now a Christian by Ion Hersiali. You can read the article for yourself and come to your own conclusion, but I wanted to just go over some of the important paragraphs um, with all of you. I want to go through some tweets as well, and then I want to talk about Ron's book. Um, so we have, uh, uh, for example, this is a thing that, that made me a little confused, uh, but I want to showcase it anyways. This was uh, posted around two days on X before Ion Hersi Ali came out with her article. So this is from the Ion Hersi Ali Foundation. And by the way, this is not me bashing any of the employees or staffers within the Ion Hersi Ali Foundation. They're all amazing people. Some of them are supporters and even members of Atheists for Liberty, great people. Uh, Ron, you and I actually met a few of them in Washington um, at our secular soiree at CPAC. Um, great people, amazing people. Um, I will continue to support the good things that the foundation does and what Ion does as an individual. But but this is this was a little weird. And this is this is why I was caught off guard with Ion's article. This is their foundation, her foundation, tweeting about atheists for liberty, my journey about creating a nonpartisan force to defend freedom and secularism, inspired by the new atheist wave, um, and how we seek to aim to be the next evolution in the atheist movement. So you have an organization talking about the next evolution in the atheist movement, Atheists for Liberty. And then you have Ion's article, which is basically a counter to that, counter to that piece on the AHA Foundation blog section. Um, I just, I wanted to share that because it just, in my view, it shows how, how annoying the situation is as well from my perspective. 
because I, I love the Ion Hersey Ali Foundation and I've agreed to blog for them as well. Um, we then have you, Ron, rightfully saying, and I really wanted to showcase this as well, you saying on Twitter about the article, disappointing to say the least. And I note that the notion of a Judeo-Christian tradition, like you said earlier here, Ron, is a 20th century invention. Christianity spent most of its existence attacking Jews and Judaism, and the ethics of tribalism and genocide set forth in the Old Testament is hardly a foundation for human rights. But of course, we're just going to ignore that. We're going to yeah. ignore that. Right. <laughs> Just, we just have the inconvenient right. fact aside. Right. Yeah, we're just going to put that fact aside. It's yeah, not convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that that was that's what Ion is saying. I'm I'm, I'm talking about critics of ours that are going right. to use what Ion says as a weapon. But we also have Michael Shermer. I'm not going to showcase his article, but he he ended up writing a response as well. I'm very happy that he did this. Um, he wrote an article saying why I am not a Christian in response to Ion Hersey Ali's declaration. Um, so. Uh, Guys, take a look at, at Michael Shermer's Substack and read that too. Very glad he wrote that. Um, Angel Eduardo, another guest on our streaming series here, um, saying part of a series of tweets, I'm disappointed every time I see the rationale she employs. People have just gotten tired of fighting and searching for meaning, so they're co uh, copping out um, and adopting this uh, defanged and bland version of Christianity, forgetting all the horrific stuff it preaches. Um, Yasma Muhammad a fellow Clarity Coalition founding member, a dear colleague, and I, I don't want to speak for Ion Hersielli, but I, I think friend of Ion Hersielli, saying, a lot of people have sent me this, asking me for my opinion, so here it is. I strongly disagree with practically every syllable of it. But to each their own, the world is full of people I vehemently disagree with on a plethora of topics onwards. Um, show a few more. But I, I wanted to showcase this to all of you guys, that we have a lot of famous atheists who have said, you know, we really respect Ayan Hirsi Ali. We are colleagues of Ayan Hirsi Ali, but she is wrong on this. I don't want us to think, well, you know what? If Ayan Hirsi Ali said it, it must have validity. It doesn't have validity. Uh, Michael Trollin, board chairman of Atheist for Liberty, co-founder technically as well of Atheist for Liberty, good friend of mine and mentor of mine, um, uh, talking about Craig Vittle, another advisor, how Craig's exactly right in his rebuttal as well. Ayan's desire to explore Christianity appears rooted in the fact that it was an effective opponent to Islamism, communism, and wokeism, but she left out the atheist answers for the purpose of life, and she made no logical arguments for the actual existence of God. You'll notice that, guys. No mentions of believing in God or Jesus' existence, nothing about the Holy Trinity, nothing about the core tenets of what it means to actually be a theist or, or a Christian, um, you know, in all intents and purposes. It's this soft, like, IDW-ish, Christianity that actually has no basis in actual faith. Um, Colin Wright, uh, I don't believe that turning to religion is the solution here. I think it complicates things even more. I have many close friends who are religious. I think they're wrong about God, but I can put that disagreement aside if we still have shared core values. I don't think less of them as people. Of course, if I think atheism is the more rational position, I'd be disappointed if someone chose to abandon it. I still have immense respect for Ion. My opinion of her and her character have not changed. I just think her decision to call herself a Christian isn't a rational one. Absolutely. Um, and then we got Justin Bakula saying, meaning and purpose was more than addressed in Stoic philosophy, speaking of an alternative as well, and many other worthwhile traditions. We don't need Christianity for that, Ion. I too lament the rise of wokeness, but wokeness or Christianity aren't the only choices. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, yeah, so, so you can argue against the, you know, the politics of identity, which I think is the, the core of what many people call wokeism, uh, without turning to Christianity. And that's exactly yeah. what I did in my book. So and we're gonna get into that. Um I I I I was really excited when you were telling me several months ago that you were coming out with a book. Um, it's amazing. And honestly, I'm so glad you came out with it because this is the kind of book that needs to come out right now in the wake of Ion's article, in the wake of, I hate to use the word Christian nationalism because it's gotten so politicized of a term, right. but actual legitimate like Christian monarchism, futurism right. and, right. and nationalism popping up. Um, you, like me, and this is why I love our phone calls, you saw the writing on the wall. And so I would love you to, t um, to tell the audience about your book, sure. um, what it's about and where people can find it. Sure. Uh, well, it's available on Amazon right now. It's, it was just released today, as a matter of fact. Kind of nice timing and light of the conjunction of events here. Uh, 
it's called, I guess, The New Politics of Identity. So you just type that in the Amazon books, you'll find it there. Essentially, what I do is uh, try to pick out what I think are the uh, core uh, themes and dogmas that are driving the, the politics of identity. When I say po the new politics of identity, I mean this idea that everything is based on group identity. And when I say everything, both theories of knowledge, uh, how society is supposedly structured, and how society should be structured. So talk about theories of knowledge. Uh, a lot of uh, the new politics of identity is based on this idea of standpoint theory, which essentially is this viewpoint that there's no such thing as objective knowledge. Uh, and furthermore, as a corollary to that, that people who are oppressed or marginalized somehow have special insight into things. And from that, we get what is now often referred to as lived experience, right? Yes. That if a person talks from their lived experience, especially if they're a marginalized person or oppressed person, which usually means you know, a black person, Hispanic or whatever, someone mm -hmm. who's not white or right. not a white woman, depending on the context, uh, somehow they have special insight and you have to defer. You must. To what they say, right, you must, right? If you somehow object to that, you're just showing your you're a racist or a sexist or a homophobe. You're showing your privilege. Your, pri your privilege. Your yeah. privilege, Ron. Right. Well, that's well. It's it's a combination of things. So they come at it both ways, right? First of all, this idea from standpoint theory that the oppressed have special insight, so they have that advantage over white people, and then white people are blinded by their privilege. So, mm -hmm. first of all, they can't rebut what someone says from their lived experience, and secondly because of their privilege, they're blinded anyway. So it's like a, yeah. a, a double whammy. And this, you know, it sounds like, well, it's kind of academic and does it really have that much input? Actually, it drives a lot of what we see in terms of limits to what people can say. It's all the whole rationale in many cases for deplatforming people, right? That, well, why should this pe person be allowed to talk about you know, racism or, you know, equity or what have you? If it's a white person, they don't understand it. Right. right. So we, we don't have to, you know, no need to hear from this person. Uh, and it's also behind this whole, I, I'm sure people are aware if you're working in some major corporation or if you're on campus somewhere, uh, the whole idea of, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion. Right. People have to suffer through these sessions where they're told about, you know, the, the sins of white supremacy or what have you. And again, if you try to question that, and you're a white person again, or a white woman, if you know, yeah. depending on the context. Uh, well, gee, you're just showing that your your ignorance and your you know your you you're showing your privilege. You don't understand things. You can't talk about this. So it's a very insidious, uh, you know, idea of what knowledge is, and it, it's it's very corrupting. And it's gone to the point where it's not just talking about social issues, but people who advocate this think that in the sciences. Right. There was an article that came out not that long ago by a black physicist who claimed that there's such a thing as white empiricism. Right. That the way we do physics is incorrect. If it's done by white people, you need the insights of people of color to do the hard sciences, which is just, well, it's frankly amazing. It's just, and it's just ridiculous. I and always used to think, yeah. Ron, that I was like too, too ignorant to see the value of scholarship um, yeah. and to see the value of education. But the more and more that these institutions are just getting corrupted and the more and more the, these these pitiful, silly words are becoming legitimate concepts. Uh, you know, maybe I was right. Maybe I was right originally about my my, my kind of my kind of um, purposeful ignorance on the topic, um, even though, by the way, I love the idea of people getting educated and going to a university if they feel like they need to. But it's like it's it almost it almost makes anybody question, like, should I even go to school now? Or if you're a parent, should I even send my kids to school if this is just all they're going to be fed and and you know they're going to come out having a degree in in you know um, dance theory uh, and try to get trying to get a job somewhere and have value and invigorate the economy? Right. Um, you know, I don't blame I don't blame these people for for coming to that conclusion. Um, you know, I definitely had that experience when I was going in for political science. Uh, you know, it's it's corrupted every institution now. So yeah. I'm very glad. Yeah. That's one out. of the latest wrinkles I want to say is the last few years, this whole idea has come up about epistemic injustice. So it's not, not just a question that somehow you're, you're a racist or whatever, if you question what one of these people of color say about some issue, but you're committing an actual injustice right. by, by questioning what they have to say. So it's, as I said, it's, it's a way of shutting down debate. It's, it's really 
it's kind of actually think about it, a very nice convenient way to just have your voice heard right and sh silence anyone else who contradicts you uh and it obviously it's against you know the whole culture of free speech which is one of the foundations of liberal democracy that's why i think it's such a threat uh so that's one aspect of what i talk about in terms of uh, the politics of identity in terms that's kind of the you know epistemological if you will or the knowledge approach but there's the ethical aspect which is this whole idea of equity and equity as it's you know used to, equity used to be just kind of a term like well justice or whatever it kind of means you know, just treating people fairly but now it has a very specific meaning which means equal outcomes based on group identity right. and it's driving public policy and also private policy and you see it across the board first of all you know, that was the Biden administration's first executive order was the order that we have to have equity driving government policy across the board. Right. And, you know, it's not just for, you know, one particular group or another. I mean, if you look at the first executive order, you actually should, you know, I reproduce it in my book, go online, look at it. It's such a laundry list of every conceivable, you know, group. You have, of course, blacks, you have Hispanics, you have lesbians, you have gay men. You have disabled people, you have immigrants. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And Ron, we're going to have to amend that because the word men is in there too. And right. eventually, you know, that's that's going to have to go out the window too because that's very, uh, right. it's very oppressive to all those non-binary individuals as well. Exactly. <laughs> and this idea that somehow you could socially engineer society so that you would get exact outcomes for each group. First of all, it tramples individual rights. The whole idea that we should treat people as individuals is out the window. And secondly, it's just, it's unrealizable. I mean, it's a dystopian vision. I mean, how would you possibly engineer you know, all facets of the economy, all facets of public policy to get equal outcomes? And if you did that at one point in time, obviously, eventually those outcomes are going to change. What are you just going to keep, you know, interfering with the economy to make sure that, oh, well, gee, you know, last year the Hispanics were a little bit behind the the Asian Americans. We have to adjust that somehow. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just ridiculous. And again, it's the idea that the, the ethical premise for that is just so misguided. Instead, we should be trying to lift, you know, treat people as individuals. Yes. Uh, well, and, you know, the the extent to which this is now guiding not just public policy, but private institutions is actually concerning. And when I was doing research for this book, it was kind of an eye opener for me to realize how far the rot had spread. And I invite people to, to Google the uh, American Medical Association's plan for uh, racial equity, their strategic plan. It came out a couple of years ago. You will be, I think, surprised and shocked at how ridiculous it is and how far you know how extreme it is i mean first of all the document is replete with denunciations denunciations of white supremacy of capitalism of meritocracy which is regarded in in this strategic strategic plan as something just horrible and invidious and it goes on and on. I mean, it looks like, I mean, if these were doctors writing it, it must have been, you know, someone who went to the che, che Guevara School of Medicine or something, because it's just, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And, you know, they're turning physicians who should be focused on treating the individual patient into social justice warriors. Right. I mean, and it's, and as I said, this is, is it's driving so many not just public institutions, but private institutions. And it's really a threat, I think, to our democracy. Now, and now Ron, if we were having this discussion, I think three, four years ago, yeah. I think you know everything that we're talking about now would have been still relevant those years ago. Yeah. But not only that, I think we would have also had even more support by some of our so-called allies in the culture war of, on supporting individual rights, supporting the idea of reason, supporting the idea of... Uh, two plus two equals four, not only being objective, but scientific and rational. And and even some of our religious colleagues who would stand up against wokeism would sit down and have an intellectual discussion with us and talk about why Ron Lindsay is so awesome and rational with with his book. Um, you know, if you if you released it a few years ago. But I like how also in the title, in just the title of the book too. You talk about how all these extremes that you just discussed, the extremes of wokeism, what we are seeing right now in the raveling Western civilization, 
it's giving birth to a completely opposite extreme. This so, kind of extreme that we just debunked with Ion's article that you have some of these now theocratic, far right Catholic nationalist type people that are popping up right now doing the same exact thing that woke people are doing now. They right. don't care about individual rights as well. They think by the group. They care about equity just for their own groups and demographics. Exactly. They don't yeah. want any reason. They think that reason is some um, Freemason conspiracy tool set up by the founding fathers, and that's so dumb, and and and, and it, the Enlightenment was some bad liberal experiment. Right. Um, that that's how they, that's how they see it too, and I'm, I'm glad that you were able to po point to both extremes and show how one is causing the growth of the other. Right. And that's I point out, and so the original title for the book, by the way, was "Dogmas Left and Right," but publisher thought that seemed to imply it was kind of too even-handed. So yeah, we switched titles. But I mean, I not only attacked the left here, but I the last chapter is devoted to the right and how you know, in fact. The left, in some sense, is driving this this resurgence of this idea of Christian nationalism. Again, that's as you point out, sometimes that phrase is misused for political right. purposes. But there is really something there. There are people who are actually Christian nationalists who want to impose their Christian values on the nation, and you know they they yeah. have a historical argument that they think gives you know justification for this because they recognize, obviously, not everyone would accept their values, but they think, well, we should do this because this country was founded as a Christian nation and they come up with the, you know this fake history to prove that so a lot of my you know chapters devoted to showing how that's just you know it's a total misreading of history the, right. the people who found this country they wanted a secular republic specifically yeah. I mean they kept there was a reason they kept God and religion out of the Constitution you know they wanted a secular and not only that, Ron, you have a lot of these, like, like literally, guys, look up, like, Nick Fuentes and the Groypers. He's somebody that really made Christian nationalism popular over the last few years. The Groyper movement and a lot of the Gen Z streamer Catholic types, you, you can hear them talk about the founding fathers. They know that we were created as a secular country. Yeah. These Christian nationalists know that and they hate it. That's why they dislike it when conservatives revere the founding fathers so much and classical yeah. liberals and libertarians revere the founding fathers so much because they think the founding fathers got it wrong. They yeah. think that if we had a like an American papacy, that we'd be in a much better society than a government that was created by the founding fathers to ensure liberty and justice for all. Yeah. That's what they yeah. want. And a lot of people just don't read into the lines of this. It's not like this classic um, 2000s religious right versus the atheist debate. It's even worse now. These people, right. you know, at least at least the old religious right tried to at least admire and appreciate the classical liberal system that that, that we came up with, and you tried to admire the founding fathers and their bad arguments against us. But now some of the Catholic nationalists, they're not even doing that because right. they hate the idea of America as a constitutional republic. They hate the idea of America and enlightenment values. They wanted a, they, they want like a man in the high castle style dictatorship. Sure, a, a confessional state, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's, as I say, that's essentially what the book is about. There's another chapter is devoted. So one of the arguments for equity, of course, is this idea that it's the only way to correct systemic racism. And if you wanted to have one dogma that is, just you cannot question it all. I mean, every outlet of mainstream media, every university, most corporations of the country, this this idea of systemic racism, it's there. It's you just accept it as something you can't question. Well, I question it. You know, so, I mean, I spent a lot of time, and actually, I spent a huge amount of time on research for this because I wanted to confront the arguments, see what they were, and essentially, if you examine it. It's based on a total misuse of the concept of disparate impact. And I'm sure if you've done any kind of, you know, you've been awake for the last five years, you know, anytime you turn on TV, read a magazine or a newspaper, or whatever, there's always a talk about, oh, this policy has a disproportionate impact or a disparate impact on people of color. Well, what does that mean? It means statistically, somehow there's some difference in how uh, whites or blacks or, you know, some other group winds up under this policy. But you have to ask a couple of questions. First of all, is there a cause-effect relationship there? And secondly, it, does a policy have some justification otherwise, right? Right. Because it may actually be good for the country overall, even though maybe it has some statistical difference in its effect. 
And they so, don't they don't understand a lot of these people when they they state you know use that language just yeah. proportionate numbers affecting this group or that group. They don't understand that a lot of people in that one group might have made individual choices to not do so, something. Right. For instance, the COVID pandemic. I think this was either the topic of masking or vaccines, for instance. Right. Um, you have a lot of these these people, and and you know whether or not somebody falls on on every bit of every issue on on what happened during the pandemic. That's a whole other story. But when it comes to vaccinations, you had a lot of these these um, I guess unfortunately now woke media companies and and organizations. I, I don't even like to use the word mainstream anymore. Um, you had a lot of them say, well, um, disproportionate numbers of African Americans or people of color. They like to say yeah. now. Are, are being affected because they didn't get the vaccine, but they didn't want to get the vaccine. You really right. think that in the year 2020 or 2021, there would be some sign in front of a, a clinic to get vaccines? I'm sorry, people, no, no black people allowed. That's absurd. Yeah. If people, they, there were so many programs, so many opportunities from the Trump administration, the Cuomo administration, the Biden administration, okay. Um, in New York, I'm, I'm using Governor right. Cuomo as an ex former Governor Cuomo's example throughout states and the country as a whole for people to be treated if they wanted to be treated. Exactly. Actually, I cover that issue at some depth. It, really, a few months after the vaccine became available, almost everyone who want who wanted the vaccine got vaccinated. And there mm -hmm. was some difference in terms of the racial composition of people who got the vaccine, but it turned out that was because of, of choice, right? You know. So yeah. For whatever reason, there's a disproportionate in terms of the, the number of blacks versus whites, but it's actually a very small percentage difference anyway. Right. Um, but as I said, I go through the various things. And one of the big myths, of course, is that in the criminal justice system, you know, there's this, you know, blacks are being killed at a huge rate. And, you know, the people have used the term genocide, you know, by police of blacks. Again, if you look at the numbers, it just it's not there. First of all, in terms of police killings more whites are killed than blacks. So it's a strange kind of genocide where the people supposedly committing the genocide are killing more of their own. Yeah, yeah, it'd be yeah. weird if you know there was that kind of genocide actually happening. So it, it defeats the whole purpose there. Right, right. And then another thing that I look at is especially the wealth gap is emphasized quite a bit. And I analyze that in great depth because it's kind of the core of the argument. And it is true if you look at certain level of statistics, cut them up in certain ways, there is a gap between, on average, uh, blacks and whites in terms of their wealth. Right. And it is true, as I, I go through the history there, there is some legacy effect from slavery, no question. But one of the biggest factors, which the people who push systemic racism never acknowledge because it would undercut their argument, is family composition. And you don't need a PhD in economics to realize if you don't have a two-person or two, you know two-parent family. You're not going to be able to accumulate as much wealth, right? As a yeah. as a, a two-parent family. And the fact is, and this is not in any way. I know people who, you know, I've brought this up, and they was going to snip it and be like, Juan Lindsay caught being racist or whatever. racist, right? But the fact is that seventy percent of the children who are black who are, are born are born to single mothers. And, you know, that's an overwhelming percentage of, you know, black children. They're being raised in single parent families. And you can't accumulate as much wealth if you're a single parent, as opposed to if, if you're, you know, a couple. And that's and horrible. That is one of the biggest factors driving the continuing gap in wealth. And it's shown by the fact that if you compare a two-parent black family with white single-parent families, the black two-parent family has more wealth. Surprise, right? No, it shouldn't be a surprise. Wow. Everyone who understand, you know, how, how two members of the workforce, not one. Right. Ron, you know, it's, it's just can't a question say that. of numbers, right? Two people can earn more money than one person. Two people can accumulate more wealth than one person. So that is a huge factor in the continuing wealth gap. And again, because it doesn't play into the narrative that people want, it's it's simply ignored. Or if you bring it up, oh, you're characterized as racist. You're making moral judgment. I'm not making moral judgment. Or you're some like radical political activist trying right. to shout at a camera. When right, right. Look, if people want more children, I believe, again, I believe in individual autonomy, individual liberty. People have a right to, to bear or not to bear children. It's their choice. But if you decide as a single parent, you want to have, you know, two, three children, 
then you can't complain about, well, gee, I have difficulty accumulating income and accumulating wealth. Yeah. It's a trade-off. You decide to have children, you know, children mm -hmm. are rewarding. I've, I've had children, right? I found being a parent rewarding. But, you know, I wasn't going to complain. Well, gee, you know, children cost so much. They had to go to college. I had to feed them and whatever. That was my choice, yeah. right? And I probably don't have as much wealth as someone who didn't have children. But that's fine. You know, that was – I got that's the part of life. That's part yeah. of life. So, anyway, as, as I say, I have a chapter in there that goes through all the different, you know, gaps or so-called gaps between blacks and whites in different areas in education, in criminal justice system. And I point out that the arguments, if you look at them closely – simply do not prove their systemic racism. I mean, certainly, I mean, at one time, obviously we had systemic racism, right? We had slavery. After that, we had a period of time where black slaves were discriminated against. But beginning in the 1960s and whatever, we had the Civil Rights Act. We had the Fair Housing Act. We've had welfare programs. And part of the welfare programs was explicitly to get, close the gap between blacks and whites. And, and just, you know, not only yeah. not only that, like federal programs and then state programs. State if you didn't right. qualify for one program, there's a multitude of 50 years worth of programs yeah. and legislation that right. you yeah. can get for yourself and your family. Right, right. And disproportionately, those have benefited blacks. So if you talk about disproportionality, not only just talk about disproportionate burdens, disproportionate benefits. And right. blacks have disproportionately benefited from these welfare programs. And I'm not saying that was wrong. I mean, if you know, if you're below a certain income, yeah, you should get food stamps or what have you. That's fine. But you can't then say, well, there's systemic racism when we have these programs that are geared to, to help people. And it turns out they disproportionately help uh, people of color. So well, I think yeah, the whole idea that we need this drive for equity is based in part on this myth, essentially, of systemic racism. And I essentially show that, you know, that, that claim is false. So we're going to go to the Q&A in a moment. But first off, I want to ask, where can people find uh, the book for purchase? Probably the easiest place, again, is Amazon. Uh, it's available mm -hmm. on Barnes. I have the link well. in the description. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, like most people, most people go to Amazon. Don't want to knock Barnes and Noble or any book other book places, but yeah, it's available on the web essentially. You know, on the internet. Yes. So you can, yeah, I have the Amazon link in the description. I have a book review, by the way. When you guys, if you guys want to find Ron's social media, if you go to the section in the description about Ron, um, there is an objective standard review of the book from our good friends at the Objective Standard Institute, a uh, great organization run by my friend and fellow AFL advisor Craig Biddle. Um, and, and definitely Ron, I, I absolutely hope that this book is sold successfully. I want, I would love to do whatever I can to, to get the word out more about the book. Um, and not only that, I would love to actually talk to you, uh, behind closed doors, um, about getting a few signed copies of the book as well. If we have to pay for it or whatever we have to do to, to get a few, uh, sent to us, because one thing I want to say to all of you too, is, um, we, we offer this for, for our members. If you sign up for an all around heretic membership or above, you can choose to have any signed copy of a book sent to your home from any one of our Atheists for Liberty advisors. Um, so we, we get in signed copies of books from the advisors. Um, we then, if there's any member who signs for a certain membership and requests a copy, we'll go ahead and AFL will mail it cost free. Um, so uh, it's something that, that we, we love to do because we want to make sure that we also not only reward you guys for for supporting our organization, making your tax deductible contributions, but also by promoting the works of so many of our amazing uh, advisors, um, Ron being th the latest with his book. And I think uh, I think it's gonna be a very interesting book tour. Richard Dawkins himself, uh, I believe wrote the forward to your book. Uh, not so much the forward, he, he gave, he, he he read the book and he was very kind to give me a promotional blurb, which is featured Good. on the back cover. Yeah, and he was very complimentary, I had to actually very uh, nice email exchange with him and uh he sees the same problems i do so so guys you can either you guys can either um you know order the book on amazon or and ron will have to talk about this or if you guys do want to sign up and become an all-around heretic or above um you know we would love to send you guys signed copies of ron's book um, so you guys can choose to do that. And also we have a membership, uh, a do donor match happening between now and the end of December. So if you choose to become a member, um, that will be doubled 
between now and December 31st. So um, that that is up to all of you, everybody, but we would greatly appreciate that so much. That's, you can do that at atheistforliberty.org. Um, if you guys like what we are doing as an organization, if you have an Instagram account, follow us at Atheist for Liberty there. If you have Twitter or X, at Atheist Liberty, follow us there. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notification bell, like the video, and like us on Facebook. We'll go over some uh, Q&As because a bunch of them popped up. There's been a lot of questions and comments going. I don't want it to, to go on forever, so we'll do that for a little bit, and then we'll head on out for the night. Um, but but let's get right to that. Um, we got uh, Physics Hypernova saying, this is a comment, she is yet another person using the we need to be Christians again to save the West argument. Yeah. And, yeah. and unfortunately, you know, Ron, I know you know this, too, a bunch of our colleagues, people that we know, um, some of them, a minority, but unfortunately a louder minority are starting to say that. And it's just not true. More and more people are joining AFL for a reason. More and more people are becoming atheists for a reason. Um, I think I think they're respectfully to all these great people doing all their other work. They're wrong. Yeah. Um, we got uh, calling it ahead of time. I bet she said something lightly complimentary of Christianity. And now all of the Christian media outlets are losing their heads looking forward to the stream. Yeah, some of them are going, oh, my God, Ion actually did this, and they're going to use it as ammo. They're going to use it as yes. ammo against us. Um, Mars, thank you so much for tuning in, man. Mars says, not sure if I agree with, uh, with that, her decision, but I think she illustrates one of the newer problems we have to deal with in the modern age. That said, I disagree with her solution. Same here. We can admire Ion for all the good that she's done while vehemently disagreeing with, uh, with, um, with what she says there. Um, my God. Yeah, yeah, I mean, she, you know, Ayan has diagnosed some of the problems that we are confronted with, as she points out, when she talks about the threat from authoritarianism, from, from Islam, from the, the politics of identity, wokeism. We don't disagree with that. What we disagree with is what she sees as a solution. Her solution really is, at the end of the day, as bad as the problem she's trying to solve. Mm -hmm. What we need yeah. to defend is defend liberal democracy which has given us the freedoms that we all enjoy. Exactly. And if Christianity is, is such a massive solution, well, you know, there are Christian dictatorships and monarchies that exist. Right. We, right. Create, we were created despite Christianity existing, despite um, this, this divine right of God allowing one person to rule right. over everybody existing. So if Christianity is so awesome, it's like, why even have liberal democracy then? Right. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we have David saying... Uh, I think he's he's quoting Ion, like, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Accepting atheism should have nothing to do with making us feel better. We should accept atheism if we think it correctly represents reality. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. lacking a belief in God. And actually, like, Ron, what you said, I think it, it also enables you to have a sort of freedom. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just literally I'm just scrolling through trying to find stuff. I want to be I want to be um, nice to everybody because uh, um because we have Roman of the Gods. Okay, he's saying what such a person is essentially saying is that we ought to disregard the validity of a specific claims of the doctrine involved. Just think about how useful the doctrine is. Oh, it's so nice. Uh, let's exactly. forget if God's actually real or not. Yeah. We have John Douglas saying she is just joining the team. She thinks she has the best shot. Even through history, clearly shows Christianity is not the solution. It's too bad she's never heard of Freedom Fellowship. Well, if you ever want to talk to me more about that, John, I'd love to learn more. You can you can contact me about that. Um, always like to learn about about new initiatives. Um, let's see. Um, Rowling says even if religious belief is good for human flourishing, that doesn't make it true. And truth is what matters. Good for good Dawkins quote. Yeah, uh, Dawkins got a lot of flack over the last few months. You know, a lot of the Jordan Peterson fans have been saying, "Oh well." You know, um, people need religion. We need to be religious. We need to have this this God shaped hole filled. Okay, that's a separate psychological discussion that we could have. Doesn't mean God is real, right? And I think that's wrong in terms of psychology too. For what it's yeah. worth, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a hole that God has to fill, right? Yeah, so like I, I understand mean, that humans need purpose, right? And a reason sure. to get up in the morning. I think that's very true, and I think that's sure. actually when Jordan Peterson became so popular throughout the last several years. He tried. I would even argue through a secular lens, um, tried to popularize the idea of mental health, psychology, um, all these all these different topics. Um, he hung out with the new atheists quite a bit 
he was he was a man of science and now he's being seen as like the apologist for religion in the West, which I, I think is a real shame as well. Um, let's see. Uh, at this point, I believe that the Abrahamic religions are some of the worst ideas our species has come up with. Yeah. No argument there. No argument there. <laughs> uh, don't disagree at all. Um, we'll do, uh, we'll go for another five, 10 minutes, guys, and then we'll uh, we'll get off. But boy, are there a lot of good comments. And by the way, if we don't showcase your comment, feel free, guys, to, to post more of them in the comment section once it turns into a recorded video. Uh, I do want to come out with some videos where I review the comments on all of our streams and clips. So I want to make sure we, that we do recognize you. We appreciate all of your feedback. There's just so much. There's just so much. This was a good stream. Um, uh, okay, so, so we have Gnostic Atheist saying, seeing some reactions on X Twitter to Ion, I think there's a lesson on compassion to be learned. I think we all agree that what she did is wrong, but as somebody who was our kin for so long, um, she shouldn't be condemned by better known atheists. In my opinion, those atheists sh uh, should show both disappointment and acceptance, adding, I hope you'll return to us again. The issue is, is I don't think she is, and um, I, you know, I, I hate to be a dozy downer, but also, um, you know, civilization is at stake, and because things are changing so rapidly, I think we we do need to be firm in standing up for our views. We don't often, too often in the anti-woke kind of community, we as atheists weren't fervent to the Christians and, and say the same things that you respectfully, Gnostic atheists, were saying to, to the atheists. Um, it's always, oh, we have to be soft on the Christians. We have to be respectful to them. We have to put the faith and God debate aside because woke is worse. But when when we stand up for our atheism, when we stand up for our principles and who we are, we get criticized now. Oh, leave the Christians alone. Leave Ion alone. Well, I think we are. I think we're being respectful to Ion as a person, but sure. we, we understand as well the damage that that article is going to do to us. Um, and so that's why, that's why I think it's very important that we shape this episode uh, about it and why actually we're talking about Ron's book in relation to this. Um, let's see. A few more comments here and there. Um, two, two, two. Yeah. Oh, speaking of Russia, Solitary Reaper saying Russia builds churches more than hospitals, church on every corner almost. Um, that's very true. That's very true. You know, we talk about a Christian society. We detest the Russian Federation for being this, this quasi dictatorship that it is. It bases its entire existence on, on God. You, you literally have Nick Fuentes speaking of the Groyper movement and the Catholic nationalist movement. He's literally said, I want an American Putin in office. Right. And in Russia is a good example of how religion can be exploited, exploited for purposes of furthering authoritarianism. Yeah. Rowling says, do you think she'll ever change her mind about labeling herself a Christian? I don't know. I'm going to, for now, pretend that she's that she's not going to, at least not for a very long time now that this article has come out. Um, so we need to move forward. But we need to move forward um, with our principles intact, with uh, our understanding that we still have a long fight ahead of us. And let's not let this stop us from doing what we need to do. The data is on our side. The facts are on our side. Um, I, I, the, the conservative movement, while it's becoming more secular, the stuff is still being said in those spaces to a degree. And they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong, especially they want to save their own movement, too, and their own ideology. They need to do that, too, from a secular lens or else their own their own movement's going to collapse, in my opinion. Um we got John Douglas saying again, Rowling, she isn't a real Christian. She's just choosing the team she thinks is the best shot right now. Christian is just a placeholder until she finds the real solution to humanity's social issues. I think maybe that's charitable. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's still a bad placeholder. Um, let's see. We'll do a few more comments here. Oh, my God. Um Mars asking, where did anyone get the idea that religion unplugged something that needed to be plugged? People can be rational uh, uh, in one area and irrational in others, like Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that, that oh, because there's this, there's this, you know, God-shaped hole that, you know, we need some kind of spirituality to fill it. Um, at least, hopefully that's how, that's how I, um, hopefully I read that correctly, Mars. Um uh, watch some of the conferences and meetings held by the hardcore socialists. At the root of all this is literally an attack on capitalism. They stir up trouble and blame it all on capitalism. I'm assuming um, that's when we were talking about uh, about the book there. And yes, um, I, I, I don't agree 
with, well, I, 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 James Lindsay is an awesome advisor to our organization and has been a good friend of ours. Um, and one thing I do agree with him on is that he talks about how now it's not about the issue for these people. It's always the revolution. So Greta uh, Thunberg, for instance, or Thunberg, um, she is known as being a massive climate change activist. She's very woke in how she goes about it. She talks about now when it comes to the climate debate, uh, uh, no, no, no freedom or no, no climate justice on occupied land or something of that with the words unoccupied land. Well, the, the debate on climate change has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, nothing whatsoever. They lump them in and they're going to continue lumping them in because once these woke people solve one tiny issue that they've been complaining about or one massive movement related issue, it's not going to be enough for them. It's like a drug. They want to keep going and keep going and keep going until this country and the Enlightenment values it was built upon are destroyed because they see it as inherently evil. Um, it's all about that revolution and winning. it. So imagine if every American was rightfully educated on climate change. That's not going to be enough for them because then it's the next battle and the next battle. It never stops for the woke activists. Um, okay, let's see. We'll do a few more here. Thank you all, by the way, all, again, so much for submitting um, these uh, these comments here. Okay, we got Mars saying, been losing respect for Jordan Peterson, but still think he's generally okay. That said, his religious arguments um, are, are fatuous. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, USA has historically demonized the USSR as being atheistic. Madeleine O'Hare once uh, toured the USSR and was shocked at how their anti-religion was just naive lip service. Um, so it's not surprising to see them going back to traditional religion. Yeah, it's all, they, they love dictatorship. They loved praising, uh, you know, the supreme being. Um, so that's that's how they are. Um, so we got a question for you, Ron. Um, do you think something like uh, the perennial philosophy could bring about a common ground between theists and atheists? Well, it, it depends on uh, how you interpret that, and I'm not that familiar, frankly, with perennial philosophy. I mean, what I think should bring about common ground between theists and atheists, uh, especially in, in the West, where we've had the benefit of liberal democracy, is seeing that together we can, you know, we can put aside our beliefs about, you know, the metaphysics of this or that and whether there's ultimately a god. Uh, people should be free to, you know, believe in God if they want to believe in God. The important thing is we should see the benefits. We're all driving the benefits from enlightenment values and from the freedom that has given us. So, yeah, that could be common ground definitely between theists and atheists. I mean, we were talking a bit before about the founding fathers. The founding fathers weren't atheists. I mean, I know sometimes atheists have, have spread that story. But, look, they were rationalists in the sense they didn't really – many of them didn't accept revealed religion – but they certainly had probably some religious beliefs. They were theists, most of them. Uh, but they founded a country based on, you know, separation of church and state, individual rights, uh, the freedoms that we're now enjoying. And so, yeah, there can be common ground definitely be between theists and atheists. That common ground should be the fight for our liberal democracy and the freedom that it's given us. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is why... It's kind of funny to see the extreme right now bashing the founding fathers, the woke people bashing the founding fathers. Yes. If you have a group of extremists bashing the people that created the greatest nation in the history on earth with the most amount of abundant freedom for people, you kind of know that you're you're might be on the wrong side. <laughs> and that doesn't uh, say that you know they were perfect. Obviously, they were imperfect. Absolutely not. Yeah, slavery and and sure they were limited good. by their times and what have you. But the point is, they laid the foundation for their freedoms. And again, those freedoms have expanded over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why they still need to be revered. In fact, we need to look at more of their works now to support what we are saying, because now these people, you have a lot of these apologists saying our, our society, our liberal order, oh, that's not enough. Um, well, I would say 200, near 250 years worth of generations of Americans would, would disagree with you on that. Um, I'll go through uh, one, uh, one more question from the same guy. Um, asking, uh, and I'll answer this too, but you can answer first, Ron. Uh, do you agree with Matt Dillahunty in that religion should be eradicated from the planet by the assumption that rationality will naturally lead people to atheism? Well, I'm an atheist, and I'm atheist principally because on an intellectual level, I don't accept the arguments for, for 
for God, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, atheism has the better of the argument. Does that mean that if you're religious, you're necessarily irrational or whatever? No, I, I think, you know, you can make a mistake in your reasoning. And at a certain level, uh, you know, some of the arguments are made, not for, you know, the, the traditional God revealed religions, you know, of Christianity or Islam or Judaism, which I think there, you know, the arguments are very weak. The idea of this, this personal God, especially, you know, tied into these various dogmas, the Trinity, which obviously makes no sense. But, you know, there are some religious people who have this idea of kind of a, you know, a, a being that somehow has to explain why there's a universe. Again, I don't think you need that, but I can understand why some people may be persuaded by that argument. And I would, would say they're irrational, that, you know, they made, made a mistake in reasoning and have drawn the wrong implication. But at a certain level, they're very complicated arguments. You know, this whole idea that somehow, you know, you can't, you can't explain the universe other than having some kind of being. Again, I think that's a false argument because then you have to explain, well, how did that being come about? But, you know, I understand why some people might might make that conclusion, and I don't necessarily think they're irrational. I think, you know, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a, a better world if we're all atheists, because a lot of atheists are, you know, let's face it, are not nice people, right? <laughs> well, of look, at, look at the people that hate, have blogged yeah. about how bad we are, you know? Right, right. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's really a question of uh, what values you have, right? Uh, and again, on an intellectual level, I think atheists have the better argument, but I think it's more important, you know, the prior person question, but can be, there can be common ground between atheists and theists. Yeah, there can be. And I'd accept certainly, you know, having a lot of religion, if it meant we were agreed on the importance of liberal democracy and the freedoms it's given us. So I guess the one thing I'll state when it comes to that question, um, do I think that the world would be better if, if I, like, I, I, I wouldn't say like if we eradicate religion, it sounds like we're state atheists who are like making religion illegal. But if people were, if more people were not religious, I do actually think the world would be a better place. However, that doesn't mean that be free from dogma. We would still be fighting irrationality from many aspects. There, there would still be plenty of ideal ideologies and dictatorships, right? Communist China, you know, something that Ion mentioned in her article, that would definitely still be a problem. We'd still have a lot of issues. Uh, but I do think that, that you know, having people being less dogmatic in some capacity is always a good thing, I think, for our society. Um, so I would like more people to individually conclude uh, that, you know, this stuff is not true. Do, that's my personal view. I would prefer that. But I will also very much defend anyone's freedom to believe in whatever religion they want to believe in, in a free society. Um, hopefully that, that also answers my end of the questions for you guys. So... Um, I'm going to end up on end the show here, guys. So tune in next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific for our next stream. We're going to be having content every single Tuesday between now and the end of the year. And speaking of stuff that's going on between now and the end of the year, guys, become a member today at atheistforliberty.org. Join our Discord. Join our Facebook group. Once you join, we'll get you in contact as well with our state directors. If you're if you're near a state that has a state director, we're starting to have more in-person meetings throughout the United States, online meetings for people throughout the world. More and more content is coming out. We're listening to all of you to fight for free speech, free thinking, and freedom for all. So it's a tax-deductible 501c3 contribution, by the way, guys. And we're getting near the giving season for people that want to donate to nonprofits. So we have a tax-exempt 501c3 status. And not only that, all donations are going to be matched and doubled through the end of the year via the David Silverman donor match. David Silverman, our advisory board chair at Atheist for Liberty, he donated $10,000 to Atheist for Liberty to be matched, to grow our membership, to grow our network, for to get us resources to be able to provide a home for all of you, to send me and other people at Atheist for Liberty to college campuses, to build a robust reactionary atheist movement in reaching out to Gen Z, the demographics that are becoming more and more secular, and people that are getting sick of the dogmas and extremism that are being forced upon them, guys. If you like what you're seeing here on the channel, subscribe to this channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to see more content. Ron, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm looking right. to more yeah. in the future. And guys, if you like Ron's book, 
become an all-around heretic member because we're going to be in it. We're, we're going to work with you, Ron, to try to get some some signed copies so we can get the word out about your great work and the research that you did, so more and more people can be educated, and hopefully not have to resort to dogma themselves. Great, fantastic. All right, thanks so much for for having me on. I enjoyed the conversation immensely. Me too, my friend. Take thanks. care, everybody. See you next week.